Great to be back with all of you and uh, one of our favorite people, the brain whisperer, Steve Campbell, and of course, Hello. my partner, John Coleman. <laughs> Thanks, Art. Hey, Steve, good to see Hello. you. Hello, good to see you again. Always good to see you. It's always a um, joy. You know, I was talking with some friends recently uh, about, in particular, children's sports teams. Um, there's still some people who who to to avoid hurting the self-esteem of the children mm -hmm. they want to sometimes they keep score sometimes they don't keep score but mostly what they do that bothers me is they want to give every kid a trophy mm -hmm. so that there are no losers there are only winners yeah and you know i have mixed feelings about that i think at a certain age sure. very very young sure winning and losing isn't important it's learn to play the game Mm -hmm. But there quickly comes a time when, if it's a game, <laughs> and it's designed to have winners and losers. And losers, yeah. You have to learn to accept that. Yeah. And you, I mean, there are good things about sports yeah, yeah. and competition yeah. Yeah. and winning and losing. Yeah. I mean, we learn from our losses, don't we? Yeah. Oh, so yeah. here's my question for you is, is self-esteem seems to me something that's very important for all mm -hmm. human beings. Mm -hmm. And yet it also seems to me that it can be misused. You can have too much of it or misplaced self-esteem. Yeah. Maybe it'd be yeah. a better way to put it. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Let me start with an observation that's really interesting. The Tokyo Olympics were just completed a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago. Most of the athletes lost. Good point. Only a few won. That's the nature of athletics. Most of us lose. So what do you do when you've been spending your life for this event and you lose? That's where self-esteem comes in. So let's look at some observations about self-esteem. Self-esteem is simply how you see yourself. It's very much connected to your self-talk and your self-images. And your self-images really come from your self-talk. So here's some interesting observations about all that. Number one, our mind will not let us be unlike ourselves. What, what does that mean? I, what does that mean, Steve? Well, let me share with you a very, very famous study that was um, done by um, Dr. Stephen Danish, a psychologist from Virginia Common, Virginia Commonwealth University. He studied lottery winners. And he got his doctorate doing this. And he noticed a trend among lottery winners who were impoverished. Do you know what they would do when they won all this money? They'd lose it. A person won $5 million in two years and now he lives in a trailer. Another person won $60 million, and she's on food stamps. Another person used her lottery, her collateral for a loan, which she could not repay. Another person opened his business with $1 million and declared bankruptcy five years later. Why did they lose the money? Because their self-images were one of being impoverished. And a person who is impoverished doesn't have money. And there is this real switch there. And the brain couldn't handle it. So they took away and they lost the money. Let's go back. Our mind will not let us be unlike ourselves. In fact, we can take that a step further. We don't let ourselves be any better than we believe we are. Let me say that again. We don't let ourselves be any better than we believe we are. So let me share with you a story of my wife, Mary. For the first 10 years of our marriage, she smoked. And when our children were born, she would go in the backyard in the corner and smoke. She would sit down at a chair and smoke with her Diet Pepsi. Because... And she would say every January 1st, this is the year, this is the year, this is the year I'm going to quit smoking and quit smoking. And it would work for a week, sometimes for a month, and then she'd go back to smoking. 
Why couldn't she quit? Here's the reason. Because her self-image, one of them said, you are a smoker. And she had had that self-image for 35 years. And her brain would say, well, if you're a smoker, why are you not smoking? And in a week, she would go back and pick up the cigarettes. Then one summer, she flew back to Michigan to watch her father die of emphysema, which is one of the most horrible ways to die. And I picked her up at the airport in San Francisco. She looked at me and she said, you are looking at a non-smoker. And she hasn't smoked since. What did she do? She made a decision. She replaced her self-talk. Notice I didn't say change. I never use the word change when I'm talking about the brain. Why? Because the brain hates the word change. The brain doesn't want you to change. The brain wants to keep you right where you're at because change always involves something different. It always involves something new. It always involves something risky. It always involves something maybe unsafe. And your brain's job is to keep you risk-free. So when you start using the word change, the brain's going to say, no, 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 no. Don't change, don't change. it." So what Mary did is she said, I'm replacing the self-image I have as a smoker with one as a non-smoker. And why is that risky in a way? Because the old self-image is still there. It's up there somewhere entangled way in the back of her mind and she could bring that self-image forward anytime she wanted to but every single time she chooses not to her brain rewires that self-image so it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger that was 25 years ago she has a smoke sense if I bought her a pack of cigarettes she would look at me with the strangest look on her face why in the world did you do that? I am a non-smoker. Okay? So let's talk about then where our self-images come from. They come from our self-talk. And those self-images determine how we feel about ourselves, which is our self-esteem. So let me give you an example. I loved to draw dinosaurs when I was a little, little, little boy, and I have three sisters, and one day I spent a Saturday drawing a T-Rex. Took it to my sister Shirley, who's the oldest. She's the expert on drawings. She had her drawings on the refrigerator of our house. And I said, look, 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 and she had her friends with us, and she didn't want to be bugged by her little brother. So she looked at the picture, and she said, Oh, Steve, that's really stupid. You can't draw. Shirley gave me an opinion, which I then recorded right up here. I can't draw, Shirley says. I did the same thing for Sally. Sally said the same thing. I put another image up here. I can't draw. Then I said, well, I'm going to do this for Mom, except I'm not only going to draw one. I'm going to draw a stegosaurus right on my wall, which I did. Crayons, paints, plaster, the whole thing. Ran down to the kitchen. Come see, come see, come see. She opened the door. Oh, Stephen, what have you done? You can't draw. What did she mean on the wall? What did I hear? I can't draw. Now, here's the dangerous part. When mom said I can't draw and Sally and Shirley, the brain began connecting those three opinions. And it created a pattern. And from that pattern came a self-image. I can't draw. And I've been saying that to myself for 74 years. Over and over and over and over and over. Now, this is really important to understand. If I had a desire to draw, I could go to the community college, take a class. I probably wouldn't be great, but I could learn how to draw. I have no desire for that. My desire is to become the best teacher I could possibly become. That's where my self-esteem is. 
if I decided that drawing is really important, something that I'm not good at, where would my self-esteem go? So what I do is I look for things that I'm naturally good at, which is teaching. Now, here's where it can get dangerous. Let me look at the work of Dr. Maxwell Maltz. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a plastic surgeon educated at Columbia University, and he specialized in female facial reconstruction. Women who had been burned, who had been hurt in accidents. When he began his practice back in 1954, he noticed a pattern. He would do the surgery. It was obviously successful. The wraps would come off. Of course, there was still scarring there, and there was, but it was obviously successful. And more often than not, the patient would look at the mirror and scream out, See, I told you it wouldn't work even though it did. And it took three to six months for the patient to finally see how successful the surgery really was. Why could not the patient see it in the beginning? Because her image, her self-esteem, had been wired up here all of her life, or since the accident. And it took a number of months for the patient to finally acknowledge, yes, it was successful. I don't have the scarring. I don't have the big bulbous nose. I do look different. That's exciting and it's scary. What's the scary part? The scary part is this, that your brain believes everything you tell it without question, no arguments. So, talk about myself. I have always been bald. I was in this horrible accident when I was 19 years old and the hair all came off. I have not been able to acknowledge that for years and years and years. In fact, I had a comb over and I saw myself with a lot of hair until I met Mary, my wife. And after being married for about a couple of months, she said to me, you know what? I could save you some money by giving you a haircut. And I said, great. We put the chair in the backyard, sat me down, put a towel over my shoulders, and she took the comb over and she just went whap and cut it off. And I screamed. I said, what are you doing? And she said, I can never imagine you with hair. You've never had hair, you've always been bald, and that's why I love you. And what happened after that is when I looked myself in the mirror, I said, you know what? I'm really good looking without hair. That's all right. And my self-esteem came up. Why? Because my self-esteem is connected to my self-images. Now here's the exciting part. Our self-images are coming from what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves. So I said to myself, until I was 25, I'm not good looking because I'm bald. But we can see what Mary did. And she switched it. And I began saying to myself, you know what? I am good looking. And what did my brain say? Oh, okay. Wait a minute, is it true? Did you know your brain doesn't ever, have to ever ask that question? According to the work of Dr. V.S. Ramachandra, not of UC San Diego, he wrote a wonderful book called Phantoms in the Brain. And he showed that we say to ourselves things that are absolutely untrue, but we believe them because the brain does that and not necessarily have to be true. So I began saying I'm really good looking, bald or not. And that's my self-esteem rose up. And that's how I see myself. So what can we do with that? What can we do with it? Number one, realize 
that how you see yourself are coming from what you are saying to yourself. Let me say that again. Dear readers, dear listeners, how you see yourself, your self-images, are coming from what you are saying to yourself in the past, no, right now. Why is that so exciting? Because you can replace that. You can replace it. Let me share with you one of my favorite stories to close. And John and Archie, you've heard this story so many times, but it's so effective. I taught math at the University of San Francisco. And after the first day of class, one semester, a student came to my office, sat down. She said, Mr. Campbell, I'm really glad you're my professor because I'm a C student in math. I said, what do you mean, Sue? She said, I have never gotten above the C in a math test. I'm a C student. I said, well, let me work with you. And I did. She got an A in the first midterm. I gave her the test, and she absolutely freaked out. She said, <gasps> and then she said, oh, Mr. Campbell, this is a mistake. What do you mean, Sue? She said, I have never gotten above the scene of math test. You must have made a mistake. And I said, I didn't, Sue. This is a genuine A. Then she looked at the, air, the test herself, and then her self-esteem just rose, and she said, do you know what this means? And I said, of course I do, Sue, but I want you to tell me. What does this mean? Mr. Campbell, this means that when I flunk my next test, I can still maintain my C. <laughs> I said, Sue, 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 just get an A on every test. She said, oh, I can't. Why? Where was her self-esteem? Where was her self-image? I am a C student. So I sat down with her. I said, Sue, answer me this. What would you have done if you had flunked this first test? Do you know what she said? She said, easy, I would have studied like crazy to get an A on the next test. Sue, just get an A on every test. She said, I can't. Why? I'm a C student. I've always been this way. I am bald. This is how I was raised. This is the way I think. This is where I get stuck. Or... Or, or, dear listener, do you know when your old life ended? It ended one second ago. So when did your new life begin? One second ago. Now do the math. 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day. In one 24-hour period, you have 86,400 new opportunities for a new life every single day. If you live to be 90, those opportunities raise to 2,883,202. All you have to do is take them. It's your choice. I love it. I love mm -hmm. it. It's your choice. That's correct. So uh, the next time you're feeling down or you can't do something, uh, talk to your brain. It'll listen. That's right. That's right. And uh, he's a, can... he not only listens, but he decides he's a, he's, he's a captive audience. He not only listens to you, but he believes you. And when you have high self-esteem, like you two guys and we do also, he does everything to raise that self-esteem. Right. And also, What else I, can I do to have higher self-esteem? I would, I would suggest to people, uh, uh, if you want to know more about how to uh, raise your self-esteem or change your habits, go to uh, the playlist on YouTube, uh, The Brain Whisperer, and uh, you can put in a search word for affirmations. And by, by telling your brain what you want it to believe in the right way, uh, you'll have a head start on uh, uh, convincing this thoughtless brain. That's right. Was that an oxymoron? Your thoughtless, uh, yeah. not an original thought brain, uh, 
yeah. that you Help are whatever you. you want yourself to be. That's right. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.